When we get an injury like a laceration or even as small as a paper cut, we need our blood to form a clot to stop that bleeding and to prevent us losing too much blood, which can be life-threatening. But what happens when clots start to form in blood vessels that are healthy? This is known as thrombotic disorders. So in this video, we're going to first understand what a thrombotic disorder is and what are some of the common causes behind thrombotic disorders, which can also be life-threatening. So a thrombus is a blood clot that forms within a blood vessel. So this could be in the arteries, in the capillaries and in the veins, but it could also be in the heart itself. Now, when this thrombus breaks off, it can move and it moves in the direction of flow of the blood, which is now called an emboli. Now, in any case, a thrombus or an embolus will prevent blood flow going to an area of the body. If it's in the heart, it can lead to a condition known as myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, or it could stop blood going to the brain, which is a cerebral vascular accident or a stroke. If it goes to the lungs, so it could come from a clot in the in the heart or in the lower legs. This could lead to something called a pulmonary embolism. So in all these cases, they are life-threatening and these conditions have plagued humans for thousands of years. But it wasn't until about 200 years ago that was a German physician known as Dr. Virchow and he proposed that there are three ingredients or three main causes behind thrombotic disorders. And this leads to the concept of today, the crux of what leads to thrombotic disorders. And this is termed Virchow's triad or Virchow's triangle. The three parts to it is the endothelial dysfunction or endothelial injury. Stasis, which means sluggish or decreased blood flow and hypercoagulability, which means the likelihood of the blood to want to clot. We're gonna start with endothelial dysfunction. So here we got a blood vessel and we know blood vessels, regardless if it's arterial, capillary or vein venous, they are lined with a special epithelial tissue known as endothelium. Endothelium is the control center of the blood. It determines whether the blood wants to be a clot. So this would be prothrombotic or it decides whether it wants to not clot, which is antithrombotic. So it plays a central role in deciding whether it needs to clot or not clot. So the endothelium is highly important here. Now, when we think of why we want it to clot, so if we had an injury where we cut a blood vessel, what would happen is the endothelium would release some factors, platelets would come accumulate in that area, forming a platelet plug, and then a whole host of coagulation factors, which are normally produced by the liver and are always in the blood, but the endothelium instructs them to become activated through different pathways. We have an intrinsic, an ex extrinsic, and a common pathway. But in any case, these coagulation factors come together and activate the final step, which is fibrinogen into fibrin, and that fibrin stabilizes that platelet plug. So now we have a clot, and that clot hopefully blocks that breach in the blood vessel and it allows it to heal and prevent blood loss. So that's what normally happens when you have injury. But most of the time we don't have injury. So the endothelial needs to have a whole host of things in place to prevent clotting all the time. And this is, this is its anticoagulation um, controlling. So one of the first things that the endothelium will do is produce a whole host of chemicals to prevent platelet ag ag aggregation or platelet plug formation. It releases prostacyclin nitric oxide and adenosine phosphatase. These essentially keep the blood vessel open and stop platelets aggregating in an area. So that would stop the, the first part of the clotting process. The next set of chemicals prevent the activation of the clotting proteins or the coagulation proteins. We've got heparin sulfate that the endothelial releases, which binds with antithrombin-3, and that goes around chopping up thrombin, um, clotting, clotting protein 10, clotting protein 9. That just basically goes around chopping any possible 
coagulation activated process when it shouldn't be. Another factor is tissue factor pathway inhibitor. This turns off the extrinsic pathway. And then over here we have thrombomodulin, which binds with thrombin and then protein C and protein S, which comes from the liver as well. And they as a whole group goes around chopping uh, factor five and factor eight, which is common pathway and intrinsic pathway. The take home point here is these steps that the endothelium produces all, all the time prevents the activation of the clot in proteins. And then finally, if there is a clot, the endothelium also releases TPA or tissue plasminogen activator, which is basically something goes around chopping up an established clot. So what I'm trying to say here is the endothelium normally when we don't have injury has a whole host of anticoagulation roles to stop blood clotting or thrombus forming in blood vessels. So when we have endothelial dysfunction, which is the first part of the triad, we can start to see the possibility of, of clots forming. So what could these be? What could cause a dysfunction? One could be hypertension. So this is more so a factor with the arterial system. So if high blood pressure is flying past, it causes injury to the endothelium and then it stops producing these chemicals. Therefore, we start to see the possibility of a clot forming. Another one would be injury. Injury to a blood vessel. This could be through trauma or surgery or even through catheters. That would be more for venous. So if a person had a catheter go in where they're going to take blood out or to allow um, medicines to be put in for long term over long periods of time, that catheter that sits in the blood vessel will injure the endothelium, therefore reducing these chemicals, therefore more likely to be clot forming. Certain chemicals that are in the blood, these could be toxins like from smoking or from chemicals from infections like toxins, exotoxins, endotoxins, that could be harmful and maybe even metabolic products. So metabolic products such as LDLs. So LDLs is a type of cholesterol. It has a likelihood of going into the blood vessel wall, LDLs, and that then oxidizes and causes injury or inflammation to the endothelium, which then reduces these factors, increases the likelihood of clots. Another one would be diabetes mellitus, which is metabolic and high amounts of glucose over a high period of time can glycosylate the endothelium, which makes it dysfunctional, decreases these factors, increasing the likelihood of clots forming. So you can see a whole host of things happening. Chronic inflammation is also playing a big role here because those cytokines, those um, pro-inflammatory chemicals can also cause dysfunction to the endothelium. Now moving to stasis, this is slowing down flow, making the flow stagnated, increasing the likelihood of the blood um, coalescing and forming uh, clots. This can happen differently in the different parts of the cardiovascular system. So we have the arterial stasis. So let's say that this is in the coronary vessel. This is the vessels of the heart. We know that we have hypertension. We know that we can get LDLs, high cholesterol. We know we can get diabetes. That increases the likelihood of endothelial dysfunction. And what starts to happen there is we get a condition known as atherosclerosis. So this then puts a plaque in the, in the blood vessel. Now, what this will do is it will change the dynamics of blood flow. So as the blood is coming down, normally we see a laminar flow, which all the cells sit in the middle and the plasma sits on the outside. But as the blood's flowing through, it disrupts this particular flow. And with the arterial system, blood smashes into the plaque, goes over the top like that, but forms an eddy in front of the plaque. That actually makes the flow in front of the plaque stasis or static or slow or um, slowing down. And that actually allows the platelet plug to start forming at the front end of an atherosclerotic plaque. So we can actually see platelet formation here in the arterial system at the front. So if this is the flow, it starts to grow at the front side of the plaque, which is actually the opposite in venous. A venous clot will actually 
grow with the blood flow, whereas an arterial would grow against the blood flow. Okay, now this is also showing because the blood is flowing so fast in an arterial system, the coagulation factors don't play such an important role. A clot is more higher percentage or higher proportion, more platelets. So this is why if we want to prevent a blood clot in an arterial system, we usually use antiplatelet medication. In any case, we can see that artery stasis happens in conditions where plaques, or if we see aneurysms where we have pouching uh, in the blood vessel wall and we start to see stagnation or stasis occurring. So this could be atherosclerosis or aneurysms. Okay, now in terms of intracardiac, so this means in the heart itself, how would blood slow down or how would stasis form in the heart? One notable one would be atrial fibrillation or AF. So the heart would be atria ventricles, atria ventricles, atria ventricles. The, when the atria beat, it wants to get rid of all its blood in that contraction. But if it's fibrillating, it's not getting rid of the blood very well. So the blood starts to stagnate or form in that part of this chamber which is not contracting well and it can start to coalesce and form a clot. That can then break off and if it's in the right side it will go to the lungs which is a pulmonary embolism or if it's the left side left atria can break off and then go up to the brain and cause a stroke. Also after MI as well so if you have a if your patient has a heart attack and part of the heart muscle ventricle part dies it doesn't contract very well and blood in that region starts to accumulate or stasis forms and that means that part of the, the heart chamber can form a clot and then that can break off and go elsewhere. So this is kind of how stasis can form within the heart. And then finally in the venous side, this would be in conditions such as deep vein thrombosis. So a deep vein thrombosis, how does it lead, how does stasis lead to that? Well, certain conditions like plane travel or immobilization, bed rest, or a breakage and you do a cast so you're not moving that limb. So DVT would be immobilization, plane travel, or even varicose veins where we have um, the way that the vessel has uh, formed, um, the dysfunction in valves and blood starts to accumulate in those peripheral vessels which then impact the way that the blood flows into the central vessels. So these are some of the examples where stasis can start to lead to the possibility of a clot forming and you can see how some of them work together where conditions here with hypertension and injury can then lead to atherosclerosis and once you start to put multiple factors together the chances of a clot forming is becoming higher and higher. Finally, we have hypercoagulability. This is essentially the cascade, the clotting cascades more likely to form. So the blood is more likely to want to start clotting. Now, the way we can categorize this is through primary and secondary causes. Primary is also known as inherited disorders. So what you inherit from mum and dad. Secondary is what you acquire during your life. One of the most common primary disorders is factor five or Leiden's factor five or Leiden's factor disorder. So this is factor five, this is made in the liver. It's a, one of the clotting proteins. It is part of the central pathway. Now with this disorder, um, it could be homozygous or heterozygous. So it's either one single gene mutation or both gene mutation in heterozygous. So this is one gene mutation. They have a five-fold increased likelihood of a clot formation. Whereas if you are homozygous, so both genes, it's a 50 fold increase in clot formation. Now the reason for why this happens is factor five with the mutation, it changes its shape. And normally over here we have thrombomodulin, which binds to thrombin, which is factor two. And then as a complex, it binds with protein C and protein S. So it's a, quite a large construct. It goes around wanting to chop five and eight up, which are activated. But over here, because we've got a mutation in factor five and its shape has changed, it no longer binds to this complex. So therefore factor five, which is part of the central process, remains activated and we have a greater likelihood of the clotting process 
to ensure. Another factor that can go wrong in the primary or inherited is prothrombin. So a prothrombin mutation increases the production rate of prothrombin, therefore more likely the activation of thrombin, and this is only one step away, because this is factor two, only one step away from the activation of fibrin, and that is the final clotting process. So increase the production of prothrombin through a gene mutation also increases the likelihood of clotting taking place by five-fold increase. When we look at secondary or acquired conditions for hypercoagulability, one is an increase in production of estrogen. Estrogen um, can come about from pregnancy or the birth control pill. So estrogen goes to the liver and instructs the liver to produce more of the clotting protein. So that increases the coagulability whilst also decreasing antithrombin 3, which is the protein that works with heparin. So also increasing the um, pro-coagulation state. We've got Cases of cancer, so certain cancers can increase the production of certain chemicals that go into the blood and activating clotting proteins and the production of certain um, clotting proteins and turn off the, the anticoagulation factors as well. We have uh, aging, so older age particularly decreases the production of prostacycline and nitric oxide, therefore more likely to activate the, the platelet plug formation and that this is possibly why uh, older persons are more likely to be prescribed an antiplatelet medication. And then finally, smoking is also a chemical that can activate the clotting proteins and increase the likelihood of coagulation. So that is a quick overview of thrombotic disorders. Hopefully now you can see the main ingredients that go into the possibility of thrombus formation. And so if you're caring for a patient or looking after a patient that has had a clot, going back to these factors to try to understand what is the cause behind it, which can allow you to prevent a more serious clot forming in the future. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.